some people would like to succeed. Some people want to succeed. Some people absolutely need to succeed. And, 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 and it's the same way in athletics. It's the same way in, in everything, really. Uh, people that are, are driven to success by not an obsession uh, or greed or something like that, but because success in itself is its own reward. Um, that type of individual is generally the one, probably the people that you're interviewing, that have been the most successful uh, overall. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the People Hum interview series. This is your host, Peha, at People Hum. People Hum is an end-to-end, one-view, integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HPM that specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Hum blog and channel that receives more than 200,000 visitors a year, and we also publish several interviews with well known names globally every month. We have with us today Frank Cottle, founder and CEO of the Alliance Group of Companies. Frank's focus since 1979 has been on building flexible workspace companies under the Alliance brand and its predecessor companies. He has a keen eye for new ways of working that genuinely meet the needs of today's entrepreneurs by combining three fundamental components, people, place, and technology. We feel privileged to have an experienced speaker, strategist, entrepreneur, advisor, business leader, and investor speak to our viewers and listeners today via Leaders Hunt. So Frank, once again, let me take this opportunity to welcome you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Okay, Frank. So uh, the first question that I want to ask you is, can you tell us a little about your company, Alliance Virtual Offices, and how that came to be? Well, as you pointed out, we've been in the flexible workspace industry since 1979, one of the, the pioneers in that industry. And we started in our first 10 years uh, really as a property company. Um, we built purpose-built buildings and projects across the southwest in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. Every 110 days for 10 years, we built a new building. So we were quite busy. Uh, <clears throat> and that's where we learned to run what are now called serviced offices or co-working centers. Mm -hmm. um, we sold that portfolio, decided we wanted to change our model and, and grow more rapidly in uh, 1990. And myself and two other partners between 90 and 2000, uh, we built uh, 195 projects across the United States. Uh, we, so we were the largest private operator of serviced offices and flexible workplace in the world at that time. Mm -hmm. um, we sold that group in uh, 2000 to a uh, private uh, equity investment company. And one of the reasons I wanted to sell, and, and it's where we are today, is that I made the decision that I wanted to own the customer, but not the center. And that required a completely different business model. And the reason I wanted to do that, if you look at, uh, follow the news in our industry, companies like IWG, Regis, WeWork, et cetera, um, whenever there's a negative swing in the marketplace, their mm -hmm. balance sheet, the lease liabilities, the debt created by that becomes an incredible burden. Uh, doesn't just suppress the value of their stock, um, in the case of IWG, but it um, <clears throat> uh, really becomes an incredible cash flow burden that is almost impossible to manage. Okay. Uh, so I recognized that uh, back in the late 90s and then decided to change our business model. And today the Alliance Virtual Company operates in 54 countries around the world. And we are the largest aggregator of customers in the flexible workspace industry. Uh, so uh, we look more, if you were to use the hospitality industry as an example, we look more like Expedia than Marriott. Uh, <clears throat> we were IWG, others look like Marriott, and we look like a Expedia because we are, in essence, a technology uh, software as a service company. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Frank, I feel like, um, you know, this is just my personal opinion that in order to do big things, you have to think big picture. And I feel like, you know, that is something that you do as well. We, we've looked at our, our uh, balance, as you say, of people, place, mm -hmm. and technology, which was a phrase that we coined uh, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, 2004, I think it was. 
when we decided somebody asked us to explain our industry, define our industry, uh, the yeah. elevator speech. Mm -hmm. We said it's quite simple. It's like making bread. You need some water, some flour, and a little salt maybe. And so we said, well, our industry is just as simple. We combine people, place, and technology into a single service that we deliver with a highly flexible service agreement as opposed to a long-term lease. So that became the foundation for the description of our industry. Uh, and it still resides today. We're, we're, we're very flattered that everybody else is now saying, oh, people, place, and technology. Uh, so we're very flattered uh, that uh, people have picked that up and, and recognize those are the, the components that actually build all industries in some respects, right, but right. in ours in particular. Uh, Frank, would you say that this, this combination of people, place, and technology, would you say that this has gained a new meaning in light of the pandemic? What are your thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> I think the pandemic uh, has accelerated a lot of change that we're, we were okay. already on the cusp of, uh, all of us. Um, we deal with a lot of uh, global uh, Fortune 1000 companies and government and, and different things. Mm -hmm. And in 2018, 2019, all of them were putting together flexible workplace plans on a large scale, very large scale, but they hadn't yet implemented them. They were trying to, uh, uh, you've heard, heard the expression maybe, don't, don't let <clears throat> uh, perfect be the enemy of good. Um, they were trying to create perfect plans. Um, <clears throat> and then the pandemic came along. Everybody just got kicked in the rear, knocked right through the door, uh, mm -hmm. and instantly had to do something. And what has occurred as a result of that is a whole new way of looking at the way that we work um, and, and looking at the way we manage people. Yeah. It's not just about the place. It's about the way we manage people. And I think... I know we did a study in our own company, and we've always worked remotely. Uh, we've, uh, we were scattered all over the world, and you know, so we've always always worked remotely, um, mm -hmm. uh, and have the technology to do so. Um, uh, but the uh, uh, when you look at uh, other companies, they they just weren't ready yet, uh, and now they are. And the thing that was driving one of the changes so strongly was um, the growth of various economies. Um, uh, the economies that were growing uh, in order to attract talent, companies like your own, um, that are growing companies and have to find the best people and, and all of that, they couldn't do it unless they had a flexible workplace program. Okay. So things are already on the move and the pandemic is just an accelerant to it. Obviously, it, it's not the accelerant people were hoping for, right. you know, because there were a, a lot of challenges and, and yes. sadly, a lot of, of, mm -hmm. of unfortunate circumstances that came along as well. But from a business point of view, we're going to learn an incredible amount. Uh, and I think, you know, they say, oh, we, we have to go back to the good old days. Now, the good old days are tomorrow. They're absolutely <laughs> tomorrow. They, 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 every day is fresh. You can never go back to yesterday. We all know that. Why even think about it? Let's use this opportunity. That's great, Stein. So um, the next question that I want to ask you, you know, in your personal experience, that leadership has many gray areas, right? So what, according to you, distinguishes a follower from a leader? In, in our company, uh, and I know in other companies as well, but in our company in particular, uh, we give everyone a little speech. Um, that uh, kind of comes from a story when I was young, but uh, the genesis of it, but the little speech basically says, if you can't make decisions on your own, we will fire you. It's real simple. The one thing that we'll fire you for is if you do not make decisions. Mm -hmm. And so everybody in the company is a decision maker. And if they make a wrong decision, that's a learning experience to us. We help them through it. We help figure it out. We, we stand behind them. Um, you know, because we insist they make decisions and what that does, mm -hmm. uh, speaking of accelerants earlier, is everybody makes a decision on their own. Everything was five times faster. Um, and so we trust the people. We're very careful when we hire and make sure we have good people, but we trust 
people to make decisions. And we think that that's an incredible difference. So everyone is a leader. There are no followers in our company. Everyone is a leader. Absolutely. And that's what we try to achieve. So I feel like while that also helps inculcating certain leadership skills, at the same time, I feel like it, it must also provide a kind of, uh, you know, a safe environment wherein they know that they can just come up with the ideas that they want to and they'll not really be judged for it. In fact, if they make mistakes, they're welcome to make them because that's how you learn and that's how you grow. So I feel like that's, well, and that's an excellent work environment that you have there. We, we, we all make mistakes uh, every day. Um, right, right. I, I, had, I, I had too much coffee this morning. I'm all wound mm -hmm. up. Okay, so that was a mistake I made. I will correct it. I won't do that tomorrow morning. Um, uh, so we all make little mistakes and big mistakes. And uh, it's, um, I guess, to, to the story, a little quick story about why we insist people make decisions. When I was a young man, I was in, in college, um, mm -hmm. and I decided in my sophomore year at the spring break uh, to go to the Bahamas. Uh, I was an ardent uh, scuba diver, and I thought this would be great. So I got down there, and I was enjoying myself quite a bit. And I mm -hmm. thought, well, I can just stay here. I got a job with a commercial company, uh, diving uh, as a commercial diver. Uh, and I, got all, I changed all my classes to independent study classes, and I did really well in college. Um, when I got back to the school, which was a small school, and you have to remember, this was in 1968, 69. There were different attitudes back then. Um, they failed me uh, for not attending. And they didn't tell me that that was going to happen in advance. Well, it was a very expensive private school that my parents had been paying for me to go for, and they didn't know I was in the Bahamas. Okay. Okay, it got a little exciting when I got home to California. So I got home and I explained to my dad, hey, um, you know, I just got failed out and uh, kicked out of college for doing this. And he looked at me, he's a very... We come from a little farming and ranching family through here in California. And he looked at me very quietly and he just said, did you learn anything? And I said, yep, decisions have consequences. <laughs> okay, and that's why we want everyone to be a decision maker on their own, to learn how to make decisions so that they can understand the consequences of those decisions and constantly correct their course. And that's how you grow a company. Right. That was a very nice story. <laughs> well, it was a pretty hard afternoon, I got to tell you. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> it was funny because that was the only thing he said to me. Yeah. That was, that was it. He just said, well, glad you learned mm -hmm. it. He walked away. That was it. Uh, so interesting. So, uh, yeah. Interesting. So, uh, Frank, in my research, I came across the idea that you're somebody who loves to share his vision for the future of work. So in that light, what has been one of your best experiences in that area? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, in all work, past, present, and future, I think the best experience and the most challenging experience is building a really good team. Um, and it starts um, with setting standards. Um, mm -hmm. this, as we talked about decisions, it starts with the set, setting uh, decision-making philosophies or rules. Um, and we uh, set a standard early in the company's uh, growth in its first iteration as a property company. We always referred to our clients as members, as if they were members of the club. And our first philosophy that we built externally um, and that we use today very strongly um, is members first. Period. That's it. So whenever a decision comes up, at our board level, at an executive level, at an individual level of, of, of a person that maybe just started with us yesterday. Mm. The rule is, what's best for the member? What is best for the member? If we constantly apply a member's first philosophy, then we will build a good team that has a common goal of service to our membership. Yeah, yeah. Our second process in building uh, a good team, which I think is the most rewarding experience in, in business, um, is family first. So on an individual basis, we think of everyone as being part of a family and 
their family as having needs beyond our company. Okay. Um, and so when someone has a problem, um, the whole team comes together and say, that person needs time off, that person needs extra support. We have to help that person get their work done. Um, mm -hmm. We have to make pay for something uh, for that family. Um, and by doing so, um, I haven't had a turnover in my executive team globally for 15 years. That is We've not had a I single person that. ever leave. And in a, wow. a fast moving tech company, that's a, a global company, uh, we're very proud of that. So the most rewarding experience, I think, is building a team that believes in the philosophies of service, both to the customers as well as to each other. That's absolutely wonderful, Frank. Um, moving on to the last question for today. So it's often said that when someone, what makes someone successful is not just their discipline, but also the hard work that gets them there. So are there any sets of habits that according to you, somebody can inculcate to get there? Well, we could go on for hours and hours about this question. <laughs> uh, but I, I think some people would like to succeed. Some people want to succeed. Some people absolutely need to succeed. And, 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 and it's the same way in athletics. It's the same way in, in everything, really. Mm -hmm. uh, people that are, are driven to success by not an obsession uh, or greed or something like that, but because success in itself is its own reward. Um, that type of individual is generally the one probably the people that you're interviewing that have been the most successful uh, overall. And the one habit that we encourage everyone, and we, again, we, we use certain phrases regularly through our, our business, is that we want everyone in our company in order to succeed to individually become the best student of the industry. So we don't want people that know their job we don't want people that know their tasks. We want people that truly understand all aspects of our industry and are able to embrace that as part of the desire to perform service. Um, if you don't, if you aren't a good student, you, you, you can't share good thoughts. You, you can't share growth, et cetera. So we've always tried to perpetuate the, that everyone takes time every day to stop and learn that part part of their process is to constantly grow and learn and, and so we encourage that we teach that we facilitate that uh, for everybody in the company on an ongoing basis that is an absolutely fresh perspective to that and i just want to add here that you know even though this applies to the work culture that you have established in your company at the same time, you know, when we speak about certain habits that people should inculcate, at the end of the day, none of those habits are, you know, even going to be of any use unless there is a learning spirit. Because at the end of the day, even learning a new habit, you can't really have that unless you want to learn or you want to just become better with each person. So I feel like that's a very good thing that you have there. Well, thank you. No, okay, it's, so, it's, uh, yeah. it's fun and it's been fun for, well, I'm, obviously not a young man, uh, <clears throat> although, although I try to think like one every day. Um, uh, you know, after 50 years in, in business, uh, doing a variety of things, but 40 with this company, um, it's easy if you stop and take the time to learn and to think philosophically about where you want to go and where you want to help others go. Um, it's not just about making money, it's about a quality of life, because um, we spend a lot of time with each other, uh, you know, in business. And mm -hmm. sometimes as much time as we spend with our families. And so you have to uh, have that overall uh, strength uh, in, in what you do uh, in order to succeed. Absolutely. So, uh, Frank, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. And I want to thank you for your time as well as your insights. I'm sure that after listening to this or after viewing this, our audience is definitely going to take away a lot. And I feel like you had many, many fresh perspectives that 
also seem fresh but they are also they also have a lot of wisdom imbibed into them so thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us and i personally will view this as a learning experience well my pleasure and anything we can ever do to help you just let us know no one can have too many friends in the world yes yes thank you so much friend.